The Blue Fairy Book by Andrew Lang The Story of Prince Hamed and Fairy Paribanu There was a sultan who had three sons and a niece. The eldest of the princes were called Hussein, the second Ali, the youngest Ahmed, and the princess, his niece, Nuruniar. The princess Nuruniar was the daughter of the younger brother of the sultan, who died and left the princess very young. The sultan took upon himself for the care of his daughter's education and brought her up in his palace with the three princes, proposing to marry her when she arrived at the proper age and to contract an alliance with some neighboring prince by that means. But when he perceived that the three princes, his sons, loved her passionately, he thought more seriously on that affair. He was very much concerned. The difficulty he foresaw was to make them agree and that the two youngest should consent to yield her up to their elder brother. As he found them positively obstinate, he sent for all them together and said to them, Children, since for your good and quiet I have not been able to persuade you no longer to aspire to the princess, your cousin, I think it would not be amiss if everyone traveled separately into different countries, so that you might not meet each other. And, as you know I am very curious, and delight in everything that's singular, I promise my niece in marriage to him that shall bring me the most extraordinary rarity, and for the purchase of the rarity you shall go in search after, and the expense of traveling I will give you every one a sum of money. As the three princes were always submissive and obedient to the sultan's will, and each flatter himself fortune might prove favorable to him, they all consented to it. The sultan paid them the money he promised them, and that very day they gave orders for the preparations for their travels, and took their leave of the sultan, that they might be the more ready to go the next morning. Accordingly, they all set out at the same gate of the city, each dressed like a merchant, attended by an officer of confidence dressed like a slave, and all well mounted and equipped. They went first day's journey together, and lay all at the inn, where the road was divided into three different tracks. At night, when they were at supper together, they all agreed to travel for a year, and to meet at that inn, and that first that game should wait for the rest, that, as they had all three taken their leave together of the sultan, they might all return together. The next morning by break of day, after they had embraced and wished each other good success, they mounted their horses and took each a different road. Prince Hussein, the eldest brother, arrived at Biznagar, the capital of the kingdom of that name, and the residence of its king. He went and lodged at the kind appointed for foreign merchants, and, having learned that there were four principal divisions where merchants of all sorts sold their commodities and kept shops, and in the midst of which stood the castle, or rather the king's palace, he went to one of these divisions the next day. Prince Hussein could not view this division without admiration. It was large and divided into several streets, all vaulted and shaded from the sun, and yet very light too. The shops were all of a size, and all that dealt in the same sort of goods lived in one street, as also the handicraftsmen who kept their shops in smaller streets. The multitude of shops, stocked with all sorts of merchandise, as finest linens from several parts of India, some painted in the most lively colors and representing beasts, trees and flowers, silks and brocades from Parsia, China and other places, porcelain both from Japan and China, and tapestries, surprised him so much that he knew not how to believe his own eyes. But when he came to the goldsmith and jewelers, he was in a kind of ecstasy to behold such prodigious quantities of rough gold and silver, and was dazzled by the luster of the pearls, diamonds, rubies, emeralds and other jewels exposed to sale. Another thing Prince Hussein particularly admired was the great number of rose sellers who crowded the streets. For the Indians are so great lovers of that flower that no one will stir without a nosegay in his hand or a garland on his head, and the merchants kept him in post in their shops that the air is perfectly perfumed. After Prince Hussein had drawn through that division, street by street, he thought fully employed on the riches he had seen. He was very much tired, which a merchant perceiving, civilly invited him to sit down in his shop when he accepted. 
but had not been set long down long before he saw a crier pass by which a piece of tapestry on his arm, about six feet square, and a cry that thirty purses. The priest called to the crier, and asked to see the tapestry, which seemed to him to be valued at an exorbitant price, not only for the size of it, but the meanness of the stuff. When he had examined it well, he told the crier that he could not comprehend how so small a piece of tapestry, and of so indifferent appearance, could be set at a higher price. The crier, who took him for a merchant, replied, If this piece seems so extravagant to you, your amazement will be greater when I tell you I have orders to raise it to forty persons, and not to part with it under. Certainly, answered Prince Hussein. It must have something very extraordinary in it, which I know nothing of. You have guessed it, sir, replied the crier, and I'll own it when you come to know that whoever sits on this piece of tapestry may be transported in an instant wherever he desires to be, without being stopped by any obstacle. At this discourse of the crier, the Prince of the Indies, considering that the principal motive of his travel was to carry the Sultan, his father, home some singular rarity, thought that he could not meet with any which could give him more satisfaction. If the tapestry, said he to the crier, as virtue you assigned it, I shall not think forty purses too much, but shall make you a present besides. Sir, replied the crier, I have told you the truth, and it is an easy matter to convince you of it, as soon as you have made the bargain for forty persons, on condition I show you the experiment. But, as I suppose you have not so much about you, and to receive them I must go with you to your khan, where you lodge, with leave of the master of the shop, we will go into the back shop, and I will spread the tapestry. And when we have both sat down, and you have formed the wish to be transported into your apartment of the khan, if we are not transported, chither it shall be no bargain and you shall be at your liberty. As to your present, though I am paid for my trouble by the seller, I shall receive it as a favor, and be very much obliged to you and thankful." On the credit of the crier, the prince accepted the conditions and concluded the bargain, and, having got the master's leave, they went into his back shop. They both sat down on it, and as soon as the prince formed his wish to be transported into his apartment, at the can he presently found himself and the crier there. And, as he wanted not a more sufficient proof of the virtue of the tapestry, he counted the crier out forty pieces of gold, and gave him twenty pieces for himself. In this manner, Prince Hussein became the possessor of the tapestry, and was overjoyed that at his arrival at Pisnagar he had found so rare a piece which he never disputed would gain him the end of Neroniar. In short, he looked upon it as an impossible thing for the princess, his younger brothers, to meet with anything to be compared with it. It was in his power, by sitting on his tapestry, to be at the place of meeting that very day, but, as he was obliged to stay there for his brothers, as they had agreed, and he was curious to see the king of Bisnagar and his court, and to inform himself the strength, the laws, customs, and religion of the kingdom, he chose to make a longer abode there, and to spend some months in satisfying his curiosity. Prince Hussein might have made a longer abode in the kingdom and court of Bisnagar, but he was so eager to be nearer the princess that, spreading the tapestry, he and the officer he had brought with him sat down, and as soon as he had formed his wish, were transported to the inn at which he and his brothers were to meet and where he passed for a merchant till they came. Prince Ali, Prince Hussein's second brother, who designed to travel into Persia, took the road, having three days after he parted with his brothers joined the caravan, and after four days' travel arrived at Chiraz, which was the capital of the kingdom of Persia. Here he passed for a jeweler. The next morning Prince Ali, who travelled only for his pleasure, and had brought nothing but just necessaries along with him, after he had dressed himself, took a walk into that part of the town which they at Shiraz called the Bezestain. Among all the criers who passed backward and forward with several sorts of goods, offering to sell them, he was not a little surprised to see one who held an ivory telescope in his hand of about a foot in length and the thickness of a man's thumb, 
and credited thirty persons. At first he thought the crier mad, and to inform himself went to a shop and said to the merchant who stood at the door, Pray, sir, is not that man? pointed to the crier who cried the ivory prospective class thirty persons. Mad. If he is not, I am very much deceived. Indeed, sir, answered the merchant. He was in his right senses yesterday. I can assure you he is one of the ablest criers we have, and the most employed of any when anything valuable is to be sold. And if he cries the ivory prospective glass at thirty purses, it must be worth as much or more, on some account or other. He will come by presently, and we will call him, and you shall be satisfied. In the meantime, sit down on my sofa and rest yourself. Prince Ali accepted the merchant's obliging offer, and presently afterward the crier passed by. The merchant called him by his name and, pointing to the prince, said to him, Tell that gentleman, who asked me if you were in your right senses, what you mean by crying that ivory prospective glass, which seems not to be worth much, at thirty purses. I should be very much amazed myself if I did not know you. The crier, addressing himself to Prince Ali, said, Sir, you are not the only person that takes me for a madman on account of this prospective class. You shall judge yourself whether I am or no, when I have told you its property and I hope you will value it at as high price as those I have showed it to already, who have as bad an opinion of me as you. First, sir, pursued the crier, presenting the ivory pipe to the prince. Observe that this pipe is furnished with a glass at both ends, and consider that by looking through one of them you see whatever object you wish to behold. I am, said the prince, ready to make you all imaginable reparations for the scandal I have thrown on you if you'll make the truth of what you advance appear. And as he had the ivory pipe in his hand, after he had looked at the two glasses, he said, Show me which of these ends I must look that I may be satisfied. The crier presently showed him, and he looked through, wishing at the same time to see the Sultan and his father, whom he immediately beheld in perfect health, sat on his throne in the midst of his council. Afterward, as there was nothing in the world so dear to him, after the Sultan, as the Princess Nurunihar, he wished to see her, and saw her at the toilet laughing and in a pleasant humor, with her women about her. Prince Ali wanted no other proof to be persuaded that this prospective glass was the most valuable thing in the world, and believed that, if he should neglect to purchase it, he should never meet again with such another rarity. He therefore took the crier with him to the can where he lodged, and counted him out the money, and received the prospective glass. Prince Ali was overjoyed at his bargain, and persuaded himself that, as his brothers would not be able to meet with anything so rare and admirable, the Princess Nurunihar would be the recompense of his fatigue and trouble. There he thought of nothing but visiting the court of Persia incognito, and seeing whatever was curious in Shiraz and thereabouts, till the caravan with which he came returned back to the Indies. As soon as the caravan was ready to set out, the prince joined them, and arrived happily without any accident or trouble, otherwise than the length of the journey and fatigue of travelling at the place of rendezvous, where he found Prince Hussein, and was waited for Prince Hamed. Prince Hamed, who took the road of Samarkand, the next day after his arrival there went, as his brothers had done, into the Bezestain, where he had not walked long but heard a crier, who had an artificial apple in his hand, cried at five and thirty purses. Upon which she stopped the crier and said to him, Let me see that apple, and tell me what virtue and extraordinary properties it has to be valued at so high rate. Sir, said the crier, giving it into its hand, If you look at the outside of this apple, it is very worthless, but if you consider its properties, virtues, and the great use and benefit it is to mankind, you will see no price for it, and that he who possesses it is master of a great treasure. In short, it cures all sick persons of the most mortal diseases, and if the patient is dying, it will recover it immediately and restore him to perfect health. 
and this is done after the easiest manner in the world, which is by the patient smelling the apple. If I may believe you, replied Prince Ahmed, the virtues of this apple are wonderful, and it is invaluable. But what ground have I, for all you tell me, to be persuaded of the truth of this manner? Sir, replied the crier, the thing is known and averred by the whole city of Samarkand. But, without going any further, ask all these merchants you see here, and hear what they say. You'll find several of them will tell you they have not been alive this day, if they had not made use of this excellent remedy. And, that you may better comprehend what it is, I must tell you it is the fruit of study and experience of the celebrated philosopher of this city, who applied himself all his lifetime to the study of knowledge of the virtues of plants and minerals, and at last attained to this composition, by which he performed such surprising cures in this sound as will never be forgot, but died suddenly himself, before he could apply his sovereign remedy, and left his wife and a great many young children behind him, in very indifferent circumstances, who, to support her family and provide for her children, is resolved to sell it. While the crown informed Prince Ahmed of the virtues of the artificial apple, a great many persons came about them and confirmed what he said, and one among the rest said he had a friend dangerously ill, whose life was despaired of, and that was a favorable opportunity to show Prince Ahmed the experiment. Upon which Prince Ahmed told the crier he would give him forty purses if he cured the sick person. The crier, who had orders to sell it at that price, said to Prince Ahmed, Come, sir, let us go and make the experiment, and the apple shall be yours, and I can assure you that it will always have the desired effect. In short, the experiment succeeded, and the prince, after he had counted out to the crier forty persons, and he had delivered the apple to him, waited patiently for the first caravan that should return to the Indies, and arrived in perfect health at the inn where the Prince Hussein and Ali waited for him. When the princes met, they showed each other their treasures, and immediately saw through the glass that the princess was dying. They then sat down on the carpet, wished themselves with her, and were there in a moment. Prince Hamed no sooner perceived himself in Noroni Ar's chamber than he rose off the tapestry, as did also the other two princes, and went to the bedside, and put the apple under her nose. Some moments after, the princess opened her eyes, and turned her head from one side to another, looking at the persons who stood about her, and then rose up in the bed, and asked to be dressed, just as if she had wakened out of a sound sleep. The women having presently informed her, in a manner that showed their joy, that she was obliged to the three princes for the sudden recovery of her health, and particularly to Prince Hamed, she immediately expressed her joy to see them, and thanked them all together, and afterward Prince Ahmed in particular. While the princess was dressing, the princess went to throw themselves at the sultan their father's feet, and pay their respects to him. But when they came before him, they found he had been informed of their arrival by the chief of the princess eunuchs, and by what means the princess had been perfectly cured. The Sultan received and embraced them with the greatest joy, both for their return and the recovery of the princess his niece, whom he loved as well as if she had been his own daughter, and who had been given over by the physicians. After the usual ceremonies and compliments, the princess presented each his rarity. Prince Hussein his tapestry, which he had taken care not to leave behind him in the prince's chamber. Prince Ali is ivory perspective glass, and Prince Hamed is artificial apple. And after each had commanded their present, when they put it into the sultan's hands, they begged of him to pronounce their fate, and declared to which of them he would give the princess Nuruniar for a wife according to his promise. The sultan of the Indies, having heard, without interrupting them, all that the princes could represent further about their rarities, and being well informed of what had happened in relation to the princess Nurunihar's cure, remained sometimes silent, as if he were thinking on what answer he should make. At last he broke the silence, and said to them, I will declare for one of you children with a great deal of pleasure, 
if I could do it with justice, that consider whether I can do it or not. This true Prince Ahmed, the princess my niece is obliged to your artificial apper for a cure. But I must ask you whether or no you could have been so serviceable to her if you had not known by Prince Ali's perspective class the danger she was in, and if Prince Hussein's tapestry had not brought you so soon. Your perspective class, Prince Ali, informed you and your brothers that you are like to lose the princess to your cousin, and there you must own the great obligation. You must also grant that knowledge would have been of no service without the artificial apple and the tapestry. And lastly, Prince Hussein, the princess would be very ungrateful if she should not show her acknowledgement of the service of your tapestry, which was so necessary a means toward or cure. But consider, it would have been a little use if you had not been acquainted with the princess's illness by Prince Ali's class, and Prince Hamed had not applied this artificial apple. Therefore, as neither tapestry, ivory perspective glass, nor artificial apple have the least preference one before the other, but, on the contrary, there is a perfect equality, I cannot grant the princess to any one of you. And the only fruit we have reaped from your travels is the glory of having equally contributed to restore her health. If all this be true, added the Sultan, you see that I must have recourse to other means to determine certainly in the choice I ought to make along you, and that, as there is time enough between this and night, I'll do it today. Go, and get each of you a bow and arrow, and repair to the great plain, where they exercise horses. I'll soon come to you, and declare I'll give the princess Nurunihar to him that shoots the furthest. The three princes had nothing to say against the decision of the sultan. When they were out of his presence, they each provided themselves with a bow and arrow, which they delivered to one of their officers, and went to the plain appointed, followed by a great concourse of people. The sultan did not make them wait long for him, and as soon as he arrived, Prince Hussein, as the eldest, took his bow and arrow and shot first. Prince Ali shot next, and much behind him and Prince Ahmed last of all, but it so happened that nobody could see where his arrow fell, and, notwithstanding all the diligence that was used by himself and everybody else, it was not to be found far or near, and though it was believed that he shot furthest, and that he therefore deserved the Princess Nerunyar, it was, however, necessary that his arrow should be found to make the matter more evident and certain, and, Notwithstanding his remonstrance, the Sultan judged in favor of Prince Ali, and gave orders for preparations to be made for the wedding, which was celebrated a few days after with great magnificence. Prince Hussein would not honor the feast with his presence. In short, his grief was so violent and insupportable that he left the court, and renounced all right of succession to the crown to turn hermit. Prince Hamad, too, did not come to Prince Ali's, and the princess Nerunyar's wedding any more than his brother Hussein, but did not renounce the world as he had done. But, as he could not imagine what had become of his hero, he stole away from his attendants and resolved to search after it, that he might not have anything to reproach himself with. With this intent, he went to the place where the princess Hussein's and Ali's were gathered up, and, going straight forward from there, looking carefully on both sides of him, he went so far that at last he began to think his labor was all in vain. But yet he could not help going forward till he came to some steep craggy rocks, which were bound to his journey, and were situated in a barren country, about four leagues distance from where he set out. When Prince Hamed came pretty nigh to these rocks, he perceived an arrow, which he gathered up, looked earnestly at it, and was in the greatest astonishment to find it was the same he shot away. Certainly, said he to himself, neither I nor any man living could shoot an arrow so far, and, in finding it lay flat, not sticking into the ground, he judged that it rebounded against the rock. There must be some mystery in this, said he to himself again, and it may be advantageous to me, perhaps fortune, 
to make me amends for depriving me of what I thought the greatest happiness, may have reserved the greater blessing for my comfort. As these rocks were full of caves and some of those caves were deep, the prince entered into one, and, looking about, cast his eyes on an iron door, which seemed to have no lock, but he feared it was fastened. However, thrusting against it, it opened, and discovered an easy descent, but no steps, which he walked down with his arrow in his hand. At first he thought he was going to a dark, obscure place, but presently a quite different slide succeeded that which he came out of, and, entering into a large, spacious place, at about fifty or sixty paces distant, he perceived a magnificent palace, which he had not then time enough to look at. At the same time, a lady of majestic port and air advanced as far as the porch, attended by a large troop of ladies, so finely dressed and beautiful that it was difficult to distinguish which was the mistress. As soon as Prince Hamed perceived the lady, he made all imaginable haste to go and pay his respects, and the lady, on her part, seeing him coming, prevented him from addressing his discourse to her first, but said to him, Come nearer, Prince Ahmed, you are welcome. It was no small surprise to the prince to hear himself named in a place he had never heard of, though so nigh to his father's capital that he could not comprehend how he should be known to a lady who was stranger to him. At last he returned the lady's compliment by throwing himself at her feet, and, rising up again, said to her, Madam, I return you a thousand thanks for the assurance you gave me of a welcome to a place where I believed my imprudent curiosity had made it penetrate too far. But, madam, may I, without being guilty of ill manners, dare to ask you by what adventure you know me, and how you, who live in the same neighborhood with me, should be so great a stranger to me? Prince, said the lady, let us go into the hall. There I'll gratify you in your request. After these words, the lady led Prince Hamed into the hall. Then she sat down on a sofa, and when the prince by her entry had done the same, she said, You are surprised, you say, that I should know you and not be known by you, but you'll be no longer surprised when I inform you who I am. You are undoubtedly sensible that your religion teaches you to believe that the world is inhabited by genies as well as men. I am the daughter of one of the most powerful and distinguished genies, and my name is Paribanu. The only thing that I have to add is that you seem to be worthy of a more happy fate than that of possessing the Princess Nurunihar, and, as you might attend to it, I was present when you drew your arrow and foresaw it would not go beyond Prince Hussein's. I took it in the air, and gave it the necessary motion to strike against the rock near which you found it, and I tell you that it lies in your power to make use of the favorable opportunity which presents itself to make you happy. As the fairy Paribanu pronounced these last words with a different tone and looked at the same time tenderly upon Prince Hamed, with a mother's blush on her cheeks, it was no hard matter for the prince to comprehend what happiness she meant. He presently considered that the princess Nurunihar could never be his, and that fairy Parivanu excelled her infinitely in beauty, agreeableness, wit, and, as much as he could conjecture by the magnificence of the palace, in immense riches. He blessed the moment that he thought of seeking after his arrow a second time, and, yielding to his love, Madam, replied he, should I all my life have the happiness of being your slave, and the admirer of the many charms which ravish my soul, I should think myself the most blessed of men. Pardon me the boldness which inspires me to ask this favor, and don't refuse to admit me into your court, a prince who is entirely devoted to you. Prince, answered the fairy, will you not pledge your faith to me, as well I give you mine to you? Yes, madam, replied the prince, in an ecstasy of joy. What can I do better and with greater pleasure? Yes, my sultaness, my queen, I'll give you my heart without least reserve. Then, answered the fairy, you are my husband and I am your wife. But, as I suppose, pursued she, that you have eaten nothing today, 
a slight repast shall be served up for you, while preparations are making for our wedding feast at night, and then I will show you the apartments of my palace, and you shall judge if this all is not the meanest part of it. Some of the fairy's women, who came into the hall with them, and guessed her intentions, went immediately out, and returned presently with some excellent meats and wines. When Prince Hamid ate and drank as much as he cared for, the fairy Peribanu carried him through all the apartments, where he saw diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and all sorts of fine jewels, intermixed with pearls, agate, jasper, porphyry, and all sorts of most precious marvels. But, not to mention the richest of the furniture, which was inestimable, there was such a profuseness throughout that the prince, instead of ever having seen anything like it, owned that he could not have imagined that there was anything in the world that could come up to it. Prince, said the fairy, if you admire my palace so much, which indeed is very beautiful, why do you say to the palaces of the chief of our genies, which are much more beautiful, spacious and magnificent? I could also charm you with my gardens, but we'll let that alone till another time. Night draws near, and it will be time to go to supper. The next hall which the fairy led the prince into, and where the cloth was laid for the feast, was the last apartment the prince had not seen, and not in the least inferior to the others. At this entrance into it, he admired the infinite numbers of scones of wax candle perfumed with amber, the multitude of which, instead of being confused, were placed with so just a symmetry as formed an agreeable and pleasant sight. A large side table was set out with all sorts of gold plate, so finely rough that the workmanship was much more valuable than the weight of the gold. Several choruses of beautiful women, richly dressed, and whose voices were ravishing, began a concert, accompanied with all sorts of the most harmonious instruments. And when they were set down at the table, the fairy Pribanu took care to help Prince Ahmed to the most delicate meats, which she named as she invited him to eat of them, and which the prince found to be so exquisitely nice that he commended them with exaggeration, and said that the entertainment far surpassed those of men. He found also the same excellence in the wines, which neither he nor the fairy tasted of till the dessert was served up, which consisted of the choicest sweet meats and fruits. The wedding feast was continued next day, or rather, the days following the celebration were a continual feast. At the end of six months, Prince Ahmed, who always loved and honored the Sultan his father, conceived a great desire to know how he was, and that desire could not be satisfied without his going to sea. He told the fairy of it, and desired she should give him leave. Prince, said she, go when you please. But first, don't take it amiss that I give you some advice how you shall behave yourself where you are going. First, I don't think it proper for you to tell the Sultan your father of your marriage, nor of my quality, nor the place where you have been. Beg of him to be satisfied in knowing you are happy and desire no more, and let him know that the sole end of your visit is to make him easy and inform me of your fate. She appointed twenty gentlemen, well mounted and equipped, to attend him. When all was ready, Prince Hamid took his leave of the fairy, embraced her, and renewed his promise to return soon. Then his horse, which was most finely caparisoned, and was as beautiful a creature as any in the Sultan of Indy's stables, was led to him, and he mounted him with an extraordinary grace. And, after he had bid her a last adieu, set forth on his journey. As it was not a great way to his father's capital, Prince Hamid soon arrived there. The people, glad to see him again, received him with acclamations of joy, and followed him in crowds to the Sultan's apartment. The Sultan received and embraced him with great joy, complaining at the same time, with a fatherly tenderness, at the affliction his long absence had been to him, which he said was the more grievous for that, fortune having decided in favor of Prince Ali, his brother, he was afraid he might have committed some rash action. The prince told the story of his adventures without speaking of the fairy, 
whom he said that he must not mention, and ended. The only favor I ask of your majesty is to give me leave to come often and pay you my respects, and to know how you do. Son, answered the Sultan of the Indies, I cannot refuse you the leave you ask me, but I should much rather you would resolve to stay with me. At least, tell me where I may send to you if you should fail to come, or when I may think your presence necessary. Sir, replied Prince Hamed, what your majesty asks of me is part of the mystery I spoke to your majesty of. I beg of you to give me leave to remain silent on this head, for I shall come so frequently that I am afraid that I shall sooner be thought troublesome than be the accused of negligence in my duty. The Sultan of the Indies pressed Prince Hamed no more, but said to him, Son, I penetrate no farther into your secrets, but leave you at your liberty. But can I tell you that you could not do me a greater pleasure than to come, and by your presence restore to me the joy I have not felt this long time, and that you shall always be welcome when you come, without interrupting your business or pleasure. Prince Hamid stayed but three days at Sultan his father's court, and forced returned to the fairy Perivenu, who did not expect him so soon. A month after Prince Ahmed returned from paying a visit to his father, as the fairy Paribano had observed that the prince, since the time that he gave her an account of his journey, his discourse with his father, and leave he asked to go and see him often, had never talked of the sultan, as if there had been no such person in the world, whereas before he was always speaking of him, she thought he forbore on her account. Therefore she took an opportunity to say to him one day, Prince, tell me, have you forgot the sultan, your father? Don't you remember the promise you made to go and see him often? For my part, I have not forgot what you told me at your return, and so put you in mind of it, that you may not be long before you acquit yourself of your promise. So Prince Hamed went next morning with the same attendance as before, but much finer, and himself more magnificently mounted, equipped and dressed, and was received by the Sultan with the same joy and satisfaction. For several months, he constantly paid his visits, always in a richer and finer equipage. At last some viziers, the Sultan's favorite, who judged of Prince Hamed's grandeur and power by the figure he cut, made the Sultan jealous of his son, saying it was to be feared he might inveil himself into the people's favor and dethrone him. The Sultan of the Indies was so far from thinking that Prince Hamed could be capable of so pernicious a design as his favorites would make him believe that he said to them, You are mistaken. My son loves me, and I am certain of his tenderness and fidelity, as I have given him no reason to be disgusted. But the favorites went on abusing Prince Ahmed till the Sultan said, Be it as it will, I don't believe my son Ahmed is so wicked as you would persuade me he is. However, I am obliged to you for your good advice, and don't dispute but that it proceeds from your good intentions. The Sultan of the Indies said this that his favorites might not know the impressions their discourse had made on his mind, which had so alarmed him that he resolved to have Prince Hamed watch unknown to his Grand Vizier. So he sent for a female magician, who was introduced by a back door into his apartment. Go immediately, he said, and follow my son, and watch him so well as to find out where he retires and bring me word. The magician left the sultan and, knowing the place where Prince Ahmed found his arrow, went immediately thither and hid herself near the rocks, so that nobody could see her. The next morning Prince Ahmed set out by daybreak, without taking leave either of the sultan or any of his court according to custom. The magician, seeing him coming, followed him with her eyes, till on a sudden she lost sight of him and his attendants. As the rocks were very steep and craggy, they were an insurmountable barrier, so that the magician judged that there were but two things for it, either that the prince retired into some cavern or an abode of genius of fairies. There happen she came out of the place where she was hid and went directly to the hollow way, which she traced till she came to the further end, looking carefully about on all sides. But, notwithstanding all her diligence, could perceive no opening, not so much as the iron gate which Prince Hamed discovered, 
which was to be seen and open to none but men, and only to such whose presence was agreeable to the fairy Paribanu. The magician, who saw it was in vain for her to search any further, was obliged to be satisfied with the discovery which he had made, and returned to give the sultan an account. The sultan was very well pleased with the magician's conduct, and said to her, Do you as you think fit. I'll wait patiently the event of your promises. And to encourage her, made her a present of a diamond of great value. As Prince Hamid had obtained the fairy Paribanu's leave to go to the sultan of the Indies' court once a month, he never failed, and the magician, knowing the time, went a day or two before to the foot of the rock where she lost sight of the prince and his attendants, and waited there. The next morning Prince Hamid went out, as usual, at the iron gate, with same attendants as before, and passed by a magician, whom he knew not to be such, and, seeing her lie with her head against the rock, and complaining as if she were in great pain, he pitied her, turned his horse about, went to her, and asked her what was the matter with her, and what he could do to ease her. The artful sorceress looked at the prince in a pitiful manner, without ever lifting up her head, and answered in broken words and sighs, as if she could hardly fetch her breath, that she was going to the capital city, but on the way thither she was taken with so violent a fever that her strength failed her, and she was forced to lie down where he saw her, far from any habitation and without any hopes of assistance. Good woman, replied Prince Ahmed. You are not so far from help as you imagine. I am ready to assist you, and convey you where you will meet with a speedy cure. Only get up, and let one of my people take you behind him." At this words the magician, who pretended sickness only to know where the prince lived and what he did, refused not the charitable offer he made her, and that her actions might correspond with her words, she made many pretended vain endeavors to get up. At the same time, two of the prince's attendants, alighting off their horses, helped her up, and set her behind another, and mounted their horses again, and followed the prince, who turned back to the iron gate, which was opened by one of its retinue who rode before. And when he came into the outward court of the fairy, without dismounting himself, he sent to tell her he wanted to speak with her. The fairy Paribanu came with all imaginable haste, not knowing what made Prince Hamed return so soon, who, not giving her time to ask him the reason, said, Princess, I desire you to have compassion on this good woman, pointing to the magician, who was held up by two of his retinue. I found her in the condition you see her in, and promise her the assistance she stands in need of, and I am persuaded that you, out of your own goodness, as well as upon my entreaty, will not abandon her. The fairy Paribanu, who had her eyes fixed upon the pretended sick woman all the time that the prince was talking to her, ordered two of her women who followed her to take her from the two men that held her, and carry her into an apartment of the palace, and take as much care of her as she would herself. While the two women executed the fairy's commands, she went up to Prince Hamed and, whispering in his ear, said, Prince, this woman is not so sick as she pretends to be, and I am very much mistaken if she is not an impostor who will be the cause of a great trouble to you. But don't be concerned. Let what will be devised against you. Be persuaded that I will deliver you out of all the snares that shall be laid for you. Go and pursue your journey. This discourse of the fairies did not in the least frighten Prince Ahmed. My princess, said he, as I do not remember I ever did or designed anybody an injury, I cannot believe anybody can have a thought of doing me one, and if they have I shall not, nevertheless, forbear doing good whenever I have an opportunity. Then he went back to his father's palace. In the meantime, the two women carried the magician into a very fine apartment, richly furnished. First they set her down upon a sofa, with her back supported with a cushion of gold brocade, while they made the bed on the same sofa before her, the quilt of which was finely embroidered with silk, the sheets of the finest linen, and the coverlet cloth of gold. When he had put her into bed, for the old sorceress pretended that her fever was so violent she could not help herself in the least, one of the women went out, and returned soon again with a china dish in her hand, full of a certain liquor, 
which she presented to the magician, while the other helped her to sit up. Drink this liquor, said she. It is water of the fountain of lions, and a sovereign remedy against all fevers whatsoever. You'll find the effect of it in less than an hour's time. The magician, to dissemble better, took it after a great deal of entreaty. But at last she took the china dish, and, holding back her head, swallowed down the liquor. When she was laid down again, the two women covered her up. Lie quiet, said she who brought her the china cup, and get a little sleep if you can. We leave you, and hope to find you perfectly cured when you come again an hour ends. The two women came again at the time they said they should, and found the magician up and dressed and sitting up on the sofa. Oh, admirable potion, she said. It was rough it's cure much sooner than you told me it would, and I shall be able to prosecute my journey. The two women, who were fairies as well as their mistress, after they had told the magician how glad they were that she was cured so soon, walked before her and conducted her through several apartments, all more noble than that wherein she lay, into a large hall, the most richly and magnificently furnished of all the palace. Fairy Paribanu sat in this hall on a throne of massive gold, enriched with diamonds, rubies, and pearls of an extraordinary size, and attended on each hand by a great number of beautiful fairies, all richly clothed. At the sight of so much majesty, the magician was not only dazzled, but was so amazed that, after she had prostrated herself before the throne, she could not open her lips to thank the fairy as she proposed. However, Paribanu saved her the trouble and said to her, Good woman, I am glad I have an opportunity to oblige you, and to see you are able to pursue your journey. I won't detain you, but perhaps you may not be displeased to see my palace. Follow my women, and I will show it to you. Then the magician went back, and related to the Sultan of the Indies all that had happened, and how very rich Prince Hamed was since his marriage with the fairy, richer than all the kings in the world, and how there was danger that he should come and take the throne from his father. Though the Sultan of the Indies was very well persuaded that Prince Ahmed's natural disposition was good, yet he could not help being concerned at the discourse of the old sorceress to whom, when she was thanking her leave, he said, I thank thee for the pains thou hast taken, and thy wholesome advice. I am so sensible of the great importance it is to me that I shall deliberate upon it in council. Now the favorites advised that the prince should be killed, but the magician advised differently. Make him give you all kinds of wonderful things, by the fairy's help, till she tires of him and sends him away. As, for example, every time your majesty goes into the field, you are obliged to be at a great expense, not only in pavilions and tents for your army, but likewise in mules and camels to carry their baggage. Now. Might not you engage him to use his interest with the fairy to procure you a tent which might be carried in a man's hand, and which should be so large as to shelter your whole army against bad weather? When the magician had finished her speech, the sultan asked his favorites if they had anything better to propose, and, finding them all silent, determined to follow the magician's advice, as the most reasonable and most agreeable to his mild government. Next day, the sultan did as the magician had advised him, and asked for the pavilion. Prince Hamed never expected that the sultan, his father, would have asked such a thing, which at first appeared so difficult, not so impossible. Though he knew not absolutely how great power of genies and fairies was, he doubted whether it extended so far as to compass such a tent as his father desired. At last he replied, Though it is with the greatest reluctance imaginable, I will not fail to ask the favor of my wife, your majesty desires, but will not promise you to obtain it. And if I should not have the honor to come again to pay my respects, that shall be decided I have not had success. But beforehand, I desire you to forgive me, and consider that you or yourself have reduced me to this extremity. Son, replied the Sultan of the Indies. I should be very sorry if what I ask of you should cause me the displeasure of never seeing you more. I find you don't know the power a husband has over a wife, and yours would show that her love to you was very indifferent if she, with the power she has of a fairy, 
should refuse you so trifling a request as this I desire you to ask of her for my sake. The prince went back, and was very sad for fear of offending the fairy. She kept pressing him to tell her what was the matter, and at last he said, Madam, you may have observed that, Etherta, I have been content with your love, and have never asked you any other favor. Consider then, I conjure you, that it is not I, but the sultan my father, who indiscreetly, or at least I think so, begs of you a pavilion large enough to shelter him, his court, and the army from the violence of the weather, and which a man may carry in his hand. But remember, it is the sultan my father asks this favor. Prince, replied the fairy, smiling, I am sorry that so small a matter should disturb you, and make you so uneasy as you appear to me. Then the fairy sent for a treasurer, to whom, when she came, she said, Norgian, which was her name, bring me the largest pavilion in my treasury. Norgian returned presently with the pavilion, which she could not only hold in her hand, but in the palm of her hand when she shut her fingers, and presented it to her mistress, who gave it to Prince Hamath to look at. When Prince Hamad saw the pavilion, which the fairy called largest in the treasury, he fancied she had a mind to jest with him, and there happened the marks of his surprise appeared presently in his countenance, which Pari Benu perceiving burst out laughing. What, prince? cried she. Do you think I jest with you? You'll see presently that I am in earnest. Nurse said she to her treasurer, taking the tent out of Prince Hamid's hands. Go and set it up, that the prince may just whatever it may be large enough for the sultan his father. The treasurer went immediately with it out of the palace, and carried it a great way off, and when she had set it up one end reached to the very palace, at which time the prince, thinking it small, found it large enough to shelter two greater armies than that of the sultan his father's, and then said to Peribanu, I ask my princess a sudden pardon for my incredulity. After what I have seen, I believe there is nothing impossible to you. You see, said the fairy, that pavilion is larger than what your father may have occasion for. For you must know that it has one property, that it is larger or smaller according to the army it is to cover. The treasurer took down the tent again, and brought it to the prince, who took it, and, without saying any longer than till the next day, mounted his horse, and went with the same attendants to the sultan his father. The sultan, who was persuaded that there could be any such thing as such a tent as he asked for, was in great surprise at the prince's diligence. He took the tent, and after he had admired its smallness, his amazement was so great that he could not recover himself. When the tent was set up in the great plain, which we have before mentioned, he found it large enough to shelter an army twice as large as he could bring into the field. But the sultan was not yet satisfied. Son, said he, I have already expressed to you how much I am obliged to you for the presence of the tent you have procured me, that I look upon it as the most valuable thing in all my treasury. But you must do one thing more for me, which will be every whit as agreeable to me. I am informed that the fairy, your spouse, makes use of a certain water, called the water of the fountain of lions, which cures all sorts of fevers, even the most dangerous, and, as I am perfectly well persuaded my health is dear to you, I don't doubt but you will ask her for a bottle of that water for me, and bring it to me as a sovereign medicine, which I make use of when I have occasion. Do me this other important piece of service, and thereby complete the duty of a good son toward the tender father. The prince returned and told the fairy what his father had said. There is a great deal of wickedness in this demand, she answered, as you will understand by what I am going to tell you. The fountain of lions is situated in the middle of a court of a great castle, the entrance into which is guarded by four fierce lions, two of which sleep alternately, while the other two are awake. But don't let that frighten you. I'll give you means to pass by them without any danger. The fairy Paribonu was at that time very hard at work, and, as she had several clues of thread by her, 
She took up one and, presenting it to Prince Ahmed, said, First take this shoe of thread. I'll tell you presently the use of it. In second place, you must have two horses. One you must ride yourself, and the other you must leave, which must be loaded with a sheep cut into four quarters, that must be killed today. In the third place, you must be provided with a bottle, which I'll give you, to bring the water in. Set out early tomorrow morning, and when you have passed the iron gate through the clue of thread before you, which will roll till it comes to the gate of the castle. Follow it, and when it stops, as the gates will be open, you will see the four lions. The two that are awake will, by their roaring, wake the other two. But don't be frightened, but throw each of them a quarter of mutton, and then clap spurs to your horse and drive for the fountain. Fill your butter without alighting, and then return with the same expedition. Glands will be so busy eating they will let you pass by them. Prince Ahmed set out next morning at the time appointed by the fairy and followed her directions exactly. When he arrived at the gates of the castle, he distributed the quarters of mutton among the four lions and, passing through the midst of them bravely, got to the fountain, filled his bottle and returned back as safe and sound as he went. When he had gone a little distance from the castle gates, he turned him about, and, perceiving two of the lions coming after him, he drew his saber and prepared himself for defense. But as he went forward, he saw one of them turned out of the road at some distance, and showed by his head and tail that he did not come to do him any harm, but only to go before him, and that the other stayed behind to follow. He put his sword up again in its scabbard. Guarded in this manner, he arrived at the capital of the Indies, but lions never left him till they had conducted him to the gates of the Sultan's palace. After which, they returned the same way they came, though not without frightening all that saw them, for all they went in a very gentle manner and showed no fierceness. A great many officers came to attend the prince while he dismounted his horse, and afterward conducted him into the Sultan's apartment, who was at that time surrounded with his favorites. He approached toward the throne, laid the bottle at the sultan's feet, and kissed the rich tapestry which covered his footstool, and then said, I have brought you, sir, the healthful water which your majesty desires so much to keep among your other rarities in your treasury, but at the same time wish you such extraordinary health as never to have occasion to make use of it. After the prince had made an end of this compliment, the sultan placed him on his right hand, and then said to him, Son, I am very much obliged to you for this valuable present, as also for the great danger you have exposed yourself to upon my account, which I have been informed of by a magician who knows the fountains of lions. But do me the pleasure, continued he, to inform me by what address, or rather, by what incredible power you have been secured. Sir, replied Prince Ahmed, I have no share in the compliments your majesty is pleased to make me. All the honor is due to the fairy, my spouse, whose good advice I followed. Then he informed the sultan what those directions were, and by the relation of this his expedition let him know how well he had behaved himself. When he had done the sultan, who showed outwardly all demonstrations of great joy, but secretly became more jealous, retired into an inward apartment, where he sent for the magician. The magician, at her arrival, saved the sultan the trouble to tell her of the success of Prince Hamad's journey, which he had heard of before she came, and therefore was prepared with an infallible means, as she pretended. This means she communicated to the sultan, who declared it the next day to the prince, in the midst of all his courtiers, in these words. Son, said he, I have one thing more to ask of you, after which I shall expect nothing more from your obedience, nor your interest with your wife. This request is, to bring me a man not above a foot and a half high, and whose beard is thirty feet long, who carries a bar of iron upon his shoulders of five and hundred weight, which he uses as a quarter staff. Prince Hamed, who did not believe that there was such a man in the world as his father described, 
would gladly have excused himself. But the sultan persisted in his demand, and told him the fairy could do more incredible things. The next day, the prince returned to his dear Paribanu, to whom he told his father's new demand, which, he said, he looked upon to be a thing more impossible than the two first. For, added he, I cannot imagine there can be such a man in the world. Without doubt, he has a mind to try whether or no I am so silly as to go about it, or he has a design on my ruin. In short, how can he suppose that I should lay hold of a man so well armed, though he is but little? What arms can I make use of to reduce him to my will? If there are any means, I beg you'll tell them, and let me come off with honor this time. Don't affright yourself, prince, replied the fairy. You ran a risk in fetching the water of the fountain of lions for your father, but there's no danger in finding out this man, who is my brother Skysbar, but is so far from being like me, though we both had the same father, that he is of so violent a nature that nothing can prevent his giving cruel marks of his resentment for a slight offence. Yet, on the other hand, it's so good as to oblige anyone in whatever they desire. He is made exactly as the sultan your father has described him, and has no other arms than a bar of iron of five hundred pounds eight, without which he never stirs, and which makes him respected. I'll send for him, and you shall judge of the truth of what I tell you. But be sure to prepare yourself against being frightened at this extraordinary figure when you see him. What? My queen, replied Prince Ahmed. Do you say Shaibar is her brother? Let him be never so ugly or deformed I shall be so far from being frightened at sight of him that, as our brother, I shall honor and love him. The fairy ordered a gold chaffing dish to be set with the fire in it under the porch of her palace, with a box of the same metal, which was a present to her, out of which, taking a perfume and throwing it into the fire, there arose a thick cloud of smoke. Some moments after the fairy said to Prince Ahmed, See, there comes my brother. The prince immediately perceived Chaibar coming gravely with his heavy bar on his shoulder, his long beard, which he held up before him, and a pair of thick mustachios, which he tucked behind his ears and almost covered his face. His eyes were very small and deep-set in his head, which was far from being of the smallest size, and on his head he wore a grenadier's cap. Besides all this, he was very much humpbacked. If Prince Hamed had not known that Schneibar was Paribanu's brother, he would not have been able to have looked at him without fear, but, knowing force who he was, he stood by the fairy without the least concern. Shaibar, as he came forward, looked at the prince earnestly enough to have chilled his blood in his veins, and asked Paribanu, when he first accosted her, who that man was. To which she replied, He is my husband, brother. His name is Hamed. He is son to the Sultan of the Indies. The reason why I did not invite you to my wedding was I was unwilling to divert you from an expedition you were engaged in, and from which I heard with pleasure you returned victorious, and so took the liberty now to call for you. At these words Shaibar, looking on Prince Ahmed favorably, said, Is there anything else, sister, wherein I can serve him? It is enough for me that he is your husband to engage me to do for him whatever he desires. The Sultan, his father, replied Paribano, has a curiosity to see you, and I desire he may be your guide to the Sultan's court. He needs but lead me the way I'll follow him. Brother, replied Paribano, it is too late to go today, therefore stay till tomorrow morning, and in the meantime I'll inform you of all that has passed between the Sultan of the Indies and Prince Hamid since our marriage. The next morning, after Shabar had been informed of the affair, he and Prince Ahmed set out for the Sultan's court. When they arrived at the gates of the capital, the people no sooner saw Shabar, but they ran and hid themselves. And some shut up their shops and locked themselves up in their houses, while others, flying, communicated their fear to all they met, who stayed not to look behind them, but ran too. Insomuch that Shabar and Prince Ahmed, 
as they went along, found the streets all desolate till they came to the palaces, where the porters, instead of keeping the gates, ran away too, so that the prince and Shaibar advanced without any obstacle to the council hall, where the sultan was seated on his throne and giving audience. Here likewise the hushers, at the approach of Shaibar, abandoned their posts and gave them free admittance. Shaibar went boldly and fiercely up to the throne, without waiting to be presented by Prince Hamed, and the coast of the Sultan of the Indies in these words. Thou hast asked for me, said he. See, here I am. What wouldst thou have with me? The Sultan, instead of answering him, clapped his hand before his eyes to avoid sight of so terrible an object. At which, uncivil and rude the reception, Shaibar was so much provoked, after he had given him the trouble to come so far, that he instantly lifted up his iron bar and killed him before Prince Hamid could intercede in his behalf. All that he could do was to prevent his killing the Grand Vizier, who sat not far from him, representing to him that he had always given the Sultan his father good advice. These are they, then, said Shaibar who gave him bed, and, as he pronounced these words, he killed all the other viziers and flattering favorites of the sultan who were Prince Ahmed's enemies. Every time he struck, he killed some one or other, and none escaped but they who were not so frightened as to stand staring and gaping, and who saved themselves by flight. When this terrible execution was over, Shaibar came out of the council hall into the midst of the courtyard with the iron bar upon his shoulder and, looking hard at Grand Vizier, who owed his life to Prince Ahmed, he said, I know here is a certain magician, who is a greater enemy of my brother-in-law than all these base favorites I have chastised. Let magician be brought to me presently. The Grand Vizier immediately sent for her, and as soon as she was brought, Shaibar said, at the time he fetched the stroke at her with his iron bar. Take the reward of thy pernicious counsel, and learn to faint sickness again. After this he said, This is not yet enough. I will use the old town after the same manner, if they do not immediately acknowledge Prince Ahmed, my brother-in-law, for their sultan and sultan of the Indies. Then all that were there present made air echo again with the repeated exclamation of Long life to Sultan Ahmed, and immediately after he was proclaimed through the whole town. Shaibar made him be clothed in royal vestments, installed him on the throne, and after he had caused all to swear homage and fidelity to him, went and fetched his sister Peribanu, whom he brought with all the pomp and grandeur imaginable, and made her to be owned Sultaness of the Indies. As for Prince Ali and Princess Nuruniar, as they had no hand in conspiracy against Prince Ahmed, and knew nothing of any, Prince Ahmed assigned him a considerable province, with its capital, where they spent the rest of their lives. Afterwards, he sent an officer to Prince Hussein, to acquaint him with the change and make him an offer of which province he liked best. But that prince thought himself so happy in his solitude that he bade the officer return the sultan his brother thanks for the kindness he designed him, assuring him of his submission, and that the only favor he desired of him was to give him leave to live retired in the place he had made choice of for his retreat. End of the story of Prince Ahmed and Fairy Paribanu.